Hello and welcome to My Come Follow Me in 20 Minutes. This week's lesson is 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Jude, which is to be studied the week of December 1st through the 8th, 2019. The title of the lesson is God is Love. In these videos, I share my thoughts and study information about the main lesson points from the Come Follow Me manual. PDF and PowerPoint versions of the presentations can be found on the website shown on this page. I've had some folks email me that they were having trouble downloading the PDFs or PowerPoints. So if you go to the website and at the top there's a menu, just hover on the New Testament word and you'll see PowerPoints and PDFs come up. Just click on one of those and then find the specific lesson that you want and click on that icon, the PDF or PowerPoint, and you should be able to bring it up. If you do have any questions, please email me at mycomfollowme at gmail. I prepared this lesson during the Thanksgiving week and there's someone I follow on Instagram called Mazer Art. I think that's how you say it. They post some really great quotes and they had some this last week about being thankful and expressing gratitude. The first one is by Elder Bednar and it says, let me recommend that periodically you and I offer a prayer in which we only give thanks and express gratitude, ask for nothing. Simply let our souls rejoice and strive to communicate appreciation with all the energy of our hearts. I do that periodically. It's good to do. We almost always want to ask for Heavenly Father for something, but it's a really good practice to do what Elder Bednar says. The next one is by Elder Cook. He says, if we truly want to have the Spirit of the Lord and experience joy and happiness, we should rejoice in our blessings and be grateful. And then Elder Uchtdorf says, we sometimes think that being grateful is what we do after our problems are solved, but how terribly short-sighted that is. How much of our life do we miss by waiting to see the rainbow before thanking God that there is rain? That's a great quote for sure. The church made a short video called Shower of Heavenly Blessings from Elder Uchtdorf's talk, which you can find on YouTube or the church's website. It's about three and a half minutes and well worth the watch. Okay, let's get started with the lesson. Here's some background. The Apostle John, whose brother was James, and both served in the ancient first presidency with Peter. In John's early life, he was a fisherman in fairly comfortable circumstances. In the latter days, Peter with James and John came from heaven and literally conferred the Melchizedek priesthood and the keys thereof upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. John also wrote Revelation, our final two lessons of the year. The apostle Jude has been traditionally understood to be the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Jude was evidently a church member of high esteem in Jerusalem, and he may have traveled as a missionary. There is no indication of what priesthood office Jude held, but the epistle of Jude itself suggests that he had a position of authority that qualified him to write letters of counsel. John and Jude wrote their epistles at a time when apostasy was threatening the church. Even though it had been only a few decades since the death of Jesus Christ, false teachers were teaching a doctrine different than the apostles had taught. Some claim that Jesus Christ had not come in the flesh. The epistles of John were probably written 80, 70 to 100, perhaps in the last few years of the first century. So this was about 40 to 70 years after Christ had died and the members were falling into apostasy. I was comparing this to the Book of Mormon in 3rd and 4th Nephi after Christ visited the Americas. They were righteous for a much longer time period. A big difference, I feel, was the influence of Jewish, Greek, Roman, and other leaders, and that was not really the case in the Book of Mormon. Maybe that's part of the difference. The Epistle of Jude was probably written about AD 40 to 80. From the Come Follow Me manuals, I'll be discussing these six lesson points. Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are perfect examples of light and love. I can become like Jesus Christ. Has no man seen God at any time? Joy comes as we help others walk in truth. As we exercise faith in Christ and are born of God, we can over, be, overcome the world. We must fortify ourselves against false teachings. The first lesson point, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are perfect examples of light and love. 1 John 1, 5 and 7 says, Then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him there is his no darkness at all. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. And John 1, 4, 7, 9, and 16 states, Beloved, 
Let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. John mentions love a ton in these chapters, thus the title of the lesson. We have this picture in our home, and I love how Christ is inviting us to come into his light and his love. The concept in D&C 50, 24 is an important one for us to learn in this life. It says, That which is of God is light, and he that receiveth light and continueth in God receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Everyone on earth has the light of Christ in them. My dad had a saying, practice makes better. That is the same with the gospel and us receiving more and more light as we strive each and every day and practice the gospel. Moses 139 gives his heavenly father's whole purpose of his plan. For behold, this is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. To me, that is the complete expression of his infinite love for us. The Come Follow Me manual has this great story from Elder Hells. He said, when I was a boy, I used to ride my bicycle home from basketball practice at night. I would connect a small pear-shaped generator to the, my bicycle tire. Then as I pedaled, the tire would turn a tiny rotor, which produced electricity and emitted a single welcome beam of light. It was a simple but effective mechanism, but I had to pedal to make it work. I learned quickly that if I stopped pedaling my bicycle, the light would go out. I also learned that when I was anxiously engaged in pedaling, the light would become brighter and the darkness in front of me would be dispelled. The generation of spiritual light comes from daily spiritual pedaling. It comes from praying, studying the scriptures, fasting and serving, from living the gospel and obeying the commandments. Here's a picture of a similar bike I had as a kid, a Schwinn Stingray. Oh, it was so fun. And I had the same kind of light on the front as Elder Hells mentioned. This concept of daily pedaling applies to all areas of our life. If we slow down or stop, we will regress. I certainly notice this in my life. As many of us are thinking of goals for 2020, especially the new program for children and youth highlighted with the four areas, the Savior, as he increased, as described in Luke 2.52, intellectually, physically, spiritually, and socially, we need to have that proper balance also that King Benjamin mentions in the Book of Mormon to not run faster than we are able. This page and the next page show the many references of love John used in these chapters. The heart by each verse shows the number of times love is mentioned in each verse. Lots and lots of love in these verses. It just all comes back to charity and love in the Gospel's plan. Lesson point number two, I can become like Jesus Christ. The Come Follow Me manual asks this question, does the goal of becoming Christ-like ever seem too lofty for you? Many days for me, yes. Here are a few scriptures to help us feel that we have hope of attaining this lofty goal. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be? But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Moroni 7.48 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all energy of heart, that ye may be filled with this love, which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ, that ye may become the sons of God, that when, ye shall, that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope that we may be purified even as he is pure. Amen. Mothers and fathers, of course, want the best for their children. In this scripture, King Benjamin explains how Christ is one of our fathers and wants to have us become like him. Messiah 5, 7. And now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he has spiritually begotten you, for ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name, therefore ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. I read an article many years ago by a Christian author titled, Becoming the King's Kid. That's certainly what I want to be, the King's Kid. 
The Come Follow Me manual referenced a gospel topic essay, Becoming Like God. I don't ever remember reading this gospel essay. I encourage you to read all of it. It's very good. Here's a, an excerpt. Latter-day Saints see all people as children of God in a full and complete sense. They consider every person divine in origin, nature, and potential. Each has an eternal core and is a beloved spirit son or daughter of heavenly parents. Each possesses seeds of a divinity and must choose whether to live in harmony or tension with that divinity. Through the atonement of Jesus Christ, all people may progress towards perfection and ultimately realize their divine destiny. Just as a child can develop the attributes of his or her parents over time, the divine nature that humans inherit can be developed and become like their heavenly fathers. The essay continues and discusses the King Follett Discourse given by Joseph Smith. Since that sermon known as the King Follett Discourse, the doctrine that humans can progress to exaltation and godliness has been taught within the church. Lorenzo Snow, the church's fifth president, coined the well-known couplet, As man now is, God once was. As God now is, man may become. Little has been revealed about the first half of this couplet, and consequently little is taught. When asked about this topic, Church President Gordon B. Hinckley told a reporter in 1997, that gets into some pretty deep theology we don't know very much about. When asked about the belief in humans' divine potential, President Hinckley responded, well, as God is, man may become. We believe in eternal progression very strongly. As President Hinckley says, this is something we don't know very much about. I do have faith and hope that through my faith and obedience, and most importantly, coupled with the Savior's atonement, I can receive all the Father has. The third lesson point, has no man seen God at any time? 1 John 4, 12 states, no man has seen God at any time. And then the Joseph Smith translation adds, except them who believe. I, of course, believe Joseph saw the Father and the Son in the sacred grove. The Come Follow Me manual adds this extra insight. In the middle it says, the scriptures record several instances when God the Father has manifested himself to faithful individuals, including John himself. Lesson point number four, joy comes as we help others walk in truth. Third John 1, one through four says, the elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wished above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly, and when the brethren came and testified the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. This scripture in John reminds me of D&C 18, 15, and 16. And if it so be that you should labor all your days in crying repentance unto this people, and bring save it be one soul unto me, how great shall be your joy with him in the kingdom of my Father? And now... If your joy will be great with one soul that you have brought unto me in the kingdom of my Father, how great will be your joy if you should bring many souls unto me. This is one of the main reasons we are here on earth, to bring the joy of the gospel to others. Lesson point number five. As we exercise faith in Christ and are born of God, we can overcome the world. 1 John 5, 3 through 5. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. I love the editorial comment from John right there. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus, Christ, that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the battle we wage every day. Elder Anderson gave a great talk titled, Overcoming the World. He said, overcoming the world is not one defining moment in a lifetime, but a lifetime of moments that define an eternity. I really like that. The four points he emphasized were love of the Savior, accountability to God, unselfishness, and safety in the prophets. The final lesson point, we must fortify ourselves against false teachings. The seminary manual says John and Jude live in a time when many people were apostatizing and leaving the church. At that time, there were various false philosophies. One of them was called deceitism. The term deceitism comes from the word, the Greek word dokio, meaning to seem or appear. 1 John 2, 18. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist, meaning false teachers, shall come, 
Even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know that, that is, this is the last time. Jude 1.10 But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast, in those things they corrupt themselves. In these next verses, Jude 1.12 and 13, Jude uses very descriptive imagery to describe the apostasy and false teachers. He writes, These are spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. In Jude 1, verses 8 through 19, Jude describes the characteristics of false teachers. Here's a list of them. As you look at them, you certainly see it's not too much different than our day than it was back in the middle times when Jude and John were writing their epistles. Throughout history, there have always been wolves in sheep's clothing. Elder Oak said the power of discernment is essential if we are to distinguish between genuine spiritual gifts and the counterfeits Satan uses to deceive men and women and thwart the work of God. The prophet Joseph Smith said, nothing is a greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of a false spirit when they think they have the spirit of God. And Elder Ballard taught, today we warn you that there are false prophets and false teachers arising, and if we are not careful, even those who are among the faithful members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will fall victim to their deception. I'm sure some of you watching have family members or friends who have left the church because of various reasons. Some may because of church history, others because of same-sex marriage or other reasons. I have some close to me that have chosen that different path and it's challenging and heartbreaking for sure. Some of you probably know of the book, The CES Letter, which came out a few years ago, where the author goes through points which led him to doubt and then to leave the church. I've read it and a few of the rebuttals, which I've sniffed from a Google search that you see on your screen. Soon after the book came out, President Uchtdorf gave a conference talk and discussed some of these items. He said, the search for truth has led millions of people to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. However, there are some who leave the church they once loved. One might ask, if the gospel's so wonderful, why would anyone leave? Sometimes we assume it's because they have been offended or lazy or sinful. Actually, it's not that simple. In fact, there is not just one reason that applies to the variety of situations. Some of our dear members struggle for years with the question whether they should separate themselves from the church. In this church that honors personal agency so strongly, that was restored by a young man who asked questions and sought answers, we respect those who honestly search for truth. It may break our hearts when their journey takes them away from the church we love and the truth we have found, but we honor their right to worship all God, Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience, just as we claim that privilege for ourselves. Some struggle with unanswered questions about things that have been done or said in the past, we openly acknowledge that in nearly 200 years of church history, along with the, an uninterrupted line of inspired, honorable, and divine events, there have been some things said and done that could cause people to question. And to be perfectly frank, there have been times when members or leaders in the church have simply made mistakes. There may have been things said or done that were not in harmony with our values, principles, or doctrine. I love President Uchtdorf's frankness in this conference talk. As I've studied, I've had questions about certain doctrines on why some things didn't happen in church history or why certain things did happen and why they took so long to happen. But I'm still in the church. The answer I've received sometimes when I've prayed regarding some of my questions is, you need to be patient and you will learn this later on, most likely in the next life. Have patient faith. I've had experience with the spirit that only could have come from heaven. I certainly agree with President Uchtdorf that some leaders, even Latter-day Prophets, have made mistakes. But I've seen this throughout the scriptures as I've studied. Prophets and leaders, they're only human. I hold fast to the iron rod because just like Heavenly Father has hastened his work, 
Satan has hastened his as well. And we need to hang on each and every day to that rod so that we can stay close to the gospel light. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.